Europe, 28 member states in the European Union, plus Norway, Switzerland, the Balkans, and so on. Germany, the UK, and France are four, five, and six in terms of the world's biggest economies. The EU collectively is the world's second biggest economy. But a lot of Europe is not so prosperous, the South and East, whereas the North Northwest is quite prosperous. And there are very stark inequalities, both across Europe and in terms of individual European countries. So I'm going to be talking about around 508 million people in 28 different countries in about 28 minutes, so it should work out really well. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I am currently European. Um, the European Union will be minus 66 million people when... Uh, Britain, um, according to the right-wing press, breaks free and the empire re-establishes itself, um, <laughs> or we plummet into darkness, one way or the other. Okay. Homelessness. There is no single European definition of what homelessness is, and that obviously has an impact in terms of how different countries respond to homelessness, what they do, how they design services. Most countries agree that people living rough and people in emergency accommodation or in uh, specialist supported housing for homeless people are homeless. Ethos, which, is part, which has been developed by FIENSA, FIENSA is the European level federation of homelessness organisations. That acronym stands for something in French that I can't pronounce, so I won't say it. They define homelessness in terms of physical domain, so having your own space that's clearly yours, social domain, so that you have a private space for you and your family and to have uh, family relationships, a home of your own, and they define it in terms of legal terms as well. So you have kind of some kind of security of tenure as, as well as that. And that's quite similar to the Australian Bureau of Statistics definition of homelessness, adequate dwelling, reasonable security of tenure, space for social relations. But homelessness in Europe is sometimes defined in terms of sort of abstract ideas about what home is, and it's sometimes, defi sometimes defined in just in terms of where people are. Or you're on the street, you're in emergency accommodation, you're homeless, but if you're not in those situations, you're not homeless. So there's all these different kinds of definitions of homelessness. That means that homelessness policies and strategies in Europe don't have the same targets. So Denmark, Finland and the UK have homeless strategies, and increasingly actually so in the UK, that target hidden homelessness, that focus on sofa surfing, on doubled up households. That's not true in a lot of other countries where their homelessness strategies and approaches are targeted on people sleeping rough, people in emergency accommodation and in supported housing. And if you're not in those situations, you're not defined as homeless, so therefore you're not targeted by services. So you have quite different sets of policies in Europe. You've got a kind of very basic get people off the street strategy, emergency accommodation. You find that in the south and east of Europe. You've got treat, accommodate and rehouse services, staircase, linear residential treatment models of doing things, which are used in some European countries. And then you've got more integrated housing-led approaches that try to provide independent housing with support. And you've got countries that are more characterised by one kind, more, ca more characterised by another kind of, of response to homelessness. But it's not just variation at the level of individual countries. There's often elements of warehousing, treatment-led, and housing-led policies all happening at once in the same country. And you have some countries, like Finland, which we heard about this morning, Denmark would be another example, where you have a clear, integrated, and joined up homeless strategy. And then you have other countries where there is inconsistency and things are all over the place. And completely at odds with the stereotypes of Germany, 
Germany is really disorganised when it comes to homelessness. It has no coherent strategy. It really varies in terms of how each individual bit of Germany responds. It's terribly inconsistent. Sweden, too. I mean, you know, there's, um, again, this kind of sense of organisation. IKEA furniture is all very precise, all of that kind of thing. Um, but again, not orchestrated at national level. And the UK varies. I mean, it's, um, it's partly because of things like administrative structure. So the UK, you've got 333 elected authorities, each one of which has to have a homeless strategy just in England. They have quite a lot of control over that homeless strategy. Then you've got Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, all of which have elected assemblies and all of which also have their own homelessness strategies. And in fact, there's about 66 million people in England, 55 million of them live in England, and England is the bit of the UK that doesn't have a national homelessness strategy. So there's those kinds of inconsistencies and lots of different countries are characterised by that. So why is housing first taken off? Why is housing first starting to um, spread in Europe? I think the way to understand that is to look a bit briefly at the sort of origin story of housing first in the US. So the work of my colleague Dennis Carhain, Steve Metro and others in the USA, which showed the presence of a small, high cost, high risk group of homeless people, around 15, 20% of the population. High cost, high risk is academic speak for severe mental illness coupled with addiction, coupled with extreme social exclusion, negative life experiences. The people for whom orthodox services, orthodox responses and sometimes don't work. That presence of that small population was combined with growing evidence that the kind of standard American response, linear residential treatment, staircase, you go in the service one end, you get made housing ready, you come out the other end, wasn't working for this specific small group of people with high costs and who are faced high risks to their well-being. And these services as well, and fatally in the American context, as well as not working well for this particular population, they're also very expensive. And Americans don't like things that are very expensive and don't work. And Housing First appeared to offer a solution that was both more effective from the point of view of ending homelessness, but was also much more cost effective. Now, from a European perspective, there was evidence of that same sort of pattern in Northwestern Europe. Not the same, there's less economic homelessness in Northwestern Europe than there is in the USA, because Northwestern Europe has much more extensive social protection welfare systems. But there was still this high cost, high risk group that was not being reached. And places like Denmark, Denmark, Ireland, the UK, Finland, France, all had this kind of long term, re re repeatedly homeless, high, high need population that weren't being reached by existing services. And just to summarize that, long term recurrent rough sleepers with high and complex needs, and forgive, this is British NHS terminology. It's a, it's a little insensitive. What the NHS calls people, National Health Service calls people who use A&E a lot, which is frequent flyers. So frequent flying population. The bigger bit of this small population is the frequent flyer. Long term and repeatedly homeless, high and complex needs. They get stuck in existing services. So another term is, is revolving door, constantly caught in services, using services repeatedly or for long periods, but their homelessness is not resolved. They're supposed to be in the supported housing for three months, four years later they're still there. And they also have really heavy levels of contact with hospitals, with mental health services and with the criminal justice system. So that's who we're talking about, that's who Housing First was seen as being a potentially useful solution for. Money's being spent, the highest need people are not, having, are not being helped, the drivers behind what you had talked about this morning, the Finnish homeless strategy, exist elsewhere in Europe, the UK and other countries as well, and Housing First appeared to offer the answer to that. <coughs> 
And every time that Housing First is deployed in Europe, it appears to work. So you have tiny pilot projects which are almost literally held together with string in the UK, in Sweden and in Italy. You have the full fat, full on government supported programs in Denmark, in Finland and the French trial, uh, which is that's possibly French for housing first. It, <laughs> it, it may refer to some kind of elaborate soup. I don't know. Um, and the subsequent national program, and consistently, even though they've got quite different levels of resources, they're working in different contexts, seven to nine out of every 10 people they work with are housed. And it's this high and complex needs group I've been, I've been talking about. But nothing's ever that simple. And I'm gonna pick up on three things quite quickly. And they're really derived from a paper that I wrote years ago just as Housing First was starting to appear in Europe. Um, and it's issues around ambiguity, issues around limits, and issues around potential risks around Housing First. Ambiguities to begin with. Sam Tesembrus, who, and others, have argued very strongly for high fidelity to the original New York model. And that's really because of what happened in the US. Federal government in the US got hold of the idea that Housing First was something that was backed by evidence because of work that Sam and others had done demonstrating that. But it didn't really define what it was when it decided to make money available. And you got the Spartacus stroke Brian effect. I'm Housing First, I'm Housing First, I'm Housing First and so is my wife. <laughs> and sometimes little more then the, then the sign changed. And you had all these services and it was a complete lack of control. The whole model started to disintegrate. Adapting the approach to Europe, bearing in mind that you've already got this kind of confusion and ambiguity happening around fidelity, Europe's really different from North America. I mean, Europe's also really different from itself. I mean, it's not one block, but the welfare state in miniature that was a North American model was necessary because there wasn't access to mental health, there wasn't access to drug services, there isn't universal health care, there isn't a welfare benefit system in the way that we would understand it in, uh, in a lot of the US. So Housing First had to function like an entire healthcare, welfare, and housing system in that context. But in Northwest Europe, there's universal welfare, there's universal health systems, and there's often extensive social housing. So it doesn't make sense to do that. Instead, it's much more logical to pursue a case management model that connects people up to the things that they are actually already entitled to as citizens. So Housing First starts to be adapted the minute it starts to hit the ground in Europe, it starts, to, it starts to change. There are all kinds of differences between what's being done in Europe and the North American model. So, the original pathways approach in New York gave people subtenancies, leases, I don't know what the Australian legal terminology would be, but rather than the person holding the tenancy, holding the right to the accommodation that was, renting, that was being rented themselves, the Housing First Service held it and sublet it to the person. So they didn't have full housing rights. European services didn't do that. They just gave people a full tenancy with full tenancy rights. The original Pathways Housing First model exercises financial control. It, in effect, it, take, it has control over people's bank accounts and it makes sure that their bills are met and then in effect gives them pocket money. European services don't do that either. Your money, your bank account. There's advice, there's support there, but it's not going to spend your money for you. In the original American model, there's a big emphasis on what Sam calls the recovery orientation, on shifting people back towards what in inverted commas is a more kind of normal life, a more normal way of living. Less emphasis on that in a lot of European services. They are a harm reduction model, but they're not looking to modify who people are or to modify their behaviour necessarily, whereas arguably the American model is, and I'll touch on that again in a, in a minute. 
while the original America model was revolutionary in many respects in North America, because it emphasised consumer choice, by some Northwestern European standards, it's not actually that choice orientated in comparison to what was being done anyway. European models move towards co-production, where the delivery and creation of a support package is very much something that is agreed between the person using the service and the person providing the service, and is actually led by the person who's using the service. It's not just consultation, it's about working together, and that's mainstream in a lot of Northwestern Europe. As we heard this morning from Yuha, um, congregate models are used, not just in Finland, in Denmark, and probably, I imagine, in the UK, they'll be used as well. And also, very importantly, Housing First was targeted differently. So in North America, it was targeted on people with a psychiatric diagnosis. But as we heard again from Finland, um, and the same in the UK, and the same in other countries, it's just targeted on long-term and repeatedly homeless people. You don't need a psychiatric diagnosis. So we're starting to shift to a position where it's actually quite different what's being done on the ground. Map of Europe, I'm sure you've seen it before. Very high fidelity to the original model in France. Quite high in Denmark. By original model, I mean the original American model, but then it falls away. Crucially though, and a very important lesson from Europe, is that all of this stuff at differing levels of supposed fidelity has very similar results. It all tends to be effective. And there's actually a kind of philosophical consistency about these services. All of these services give people choice and control. All of them use a harm reduction model. All of them separate housing from, from support, so your housing's not conditional on you using the support. They give you your own settled home and mobile support that comes to you. They're housing plus user-led support services but they don't copy the original North American model in terms of operational details, and they don't copy it to the same extent around attempts around behavioural modification. Moving on to the limits. One thing to be careful about is the evidence base. It's still largely North American, and Housing First is often compar being compared in the North American evidence base with treatment as usual services that are not like European services, because they're basically a lot harsher, more abstinence based. And Housing First in North America is operating in a different context, it's being compared with different kinds of services than exist in Europe, and it's in a different cultural setting as well. Now, all the points I've just made are in a very good review written by Guy Johnson sitting over there and his colleagues, which looked at the evidence about Housing First and considered what the issues would be for Australia. And really, the issues for Australia are the same kind of issues for, for Europe and, the, and exactly the kind of stuff I'm raising now around this. So, Housing First, really top on rehousing rates. I was going to make some crap joke about boundaries or hitting a six on... I've done it already, um, <laughs> around um, how good it is at, 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 um, at rehousing people with high and complex needs. But while you need to allow some time for results because people do have high and complex needs, the evidence base around physical and mental health, drugs and alcohol, social integration is a lot more choppy, a lot more variable, and that's across the board. That includes the one really kind of long study which we've got at the minute, although the data is starting to build up, which is a five-year study that was done in the States, and the European evidence base. So very good on rehousing, but the other stuff, not so much. And you've got some criticisms going on. One of them is an American criticism that this is just dispersed warehousing. We're still doing the same thing, but just putting in people in the, in the same place. I don't think that stands up because of the qualitative evidence. If you ask people using Housing First what they feel about it, they feel very positive about it. And we've got to take that as an indicator about how successful it is. Another American criticism is it's not doing anything beyond housing. Well, there's some truth in that, but I always think of um, the words of my dear German colleague, Volker Buschkitz-Hemer, <laughs> 
who says, what do you expect any single service to do? You can't, it, you can't expect any single intervention to somehow solve everything for everybody. So be realistic about what you're expecting something to do. Because if you set it up as, as achieving the impossible, you're always going to be disappointed. So be realistic about that. And then this is kind of European sociology. You have to imagine it being said by a sort of slightly disparaging Frenchman <laughs> with a smoking a cigarette and a pavement cafe. Behavioural modification using flawed North American constructs of homelessness as deviant individual pathology. <laughs> I have to say crap like that because I'm a professor. But <laughs> what it means is it's still, it can be criticised and there is the potentially serious criticism that it's still all about the individual, their choices, their characteristics. And if you start talking about homelessness in those terms, and a lot of what's been said about this co about, uh, at this conference is about this, it's about the, uh, how far do you focus on that? And the risk around something like Housing First is you over-focus on that, even inadvertently, and you start forgetting or not paying enough attention to the structural stuff around housing supply and all the other issues that you've been raising over, the, over these two days. So... There are some limits. Housing First is for people with high and complex needs. In a lot of Europe, France, Ireland, UK, most homelessness is not like that. There's economic causation, there's domestic violence, which is particularly linked to family homelessness. And Housing First is care and support for high need groups. A lot of people just need a house or a bit of short term help to exit homelessness. That's the reality of what that homeless population is like. And there's crucial evidence that from the US that shows that the idea of, that a lot of people have around mental health, drug use and addiction and so forth as being a trigger for homelessness, while it can be, a lot of people don't start up like that, but if they, if they can't exit homelessness or they, repeat, they experience it repeatedly, then issues around mental health, addiction and other things can happen after homelessness has occurred. So there's a good, strong argument that it's better to prevent than it is to try and um, deal with the aftermath. And it's probably cheaper to prevent as well as being better in from a human point of view. So there's also differences in environments, and I think this is, this is quite an important point. So places like Denmark and Finland, I, I had a... Q&A at an English uh, homeless service provider conference and they, we were supposed to, you know, there was a panel of us and one of the questions was, what would you need if you were homeless? And I said, a plane ticket to Helsinki, please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but in Denmark and Finland, from a sort of UK, French, German perspective, Homelessness is a kind of residual social problem. By residual, I mean it's a relatively small social problem. Now, homelessness is still a hugely damaging thing to happen, but the ex already extensive social protection, social housing systems in these countries mean that it's unusual anyway, relatively speaking. So Danish and Finnish people might have higher and more complex needs than the homeless population in somewhere like the UK because they've fallen through very extensive social protection nets, through very extensive welfare systems and so on. That's less true elsewhere. And although the UK, for example, or France or Germany have got relatively extensive social protection systems, welfare systems, social housing systems, you still get homelessness being triggered largely and essentially by poverty. Stuff on cost effectiveness, I'm going to have to speed up a bit. Stuff on cost, cost effectiveness, I won't go into huge detail on this. The, be the best American evidence concludes that housing first costs about the same as existing services, rather than necessarily saving money, but it's cost effective because more people are taken out of homelessness than is the case if you were spending on the more traditional um, linear residential treatment staircase models of services. Limited UK and European evidence um, suggests a similar kind of pattern, and there may be significant cost offsets. Cost offsets means 
the person isn't getting arrested 30 times a year, they aren't being in the emergency room 40 times a year. And where Housing First is stopping that, there's a very clear public expenditure saving. The thing is that it's not that straightforward because Housing First can also cause a spike in public expenditure. Somebody's been on the street for a long time, the only service they've used is something that gives them soup. Housing First picks them up and it connects them up to everything they should have been having for the last five years and the expenditure on that person skyrockets because everything that wasn't being treated, everything that wasn't being supported now is. So you're going to get huge savings on the one hand, but you might get peaks in expenditure on the other on the other hand as well. The other thing is that someone has to be costing quite a lot in terms of their overall service use for there to be a clear and consistent financial saving from Housing First. And lastly, I'll talk a bit about the risks. Housing First solves homelessness, question mark. Well, yeah, it can get people with high and complex needs off the street and stop, to use the NHS terminology again, stop frequent flying. But it only solves homelessness if you're focusing, focusing on homelessness in those terms about that population. And even then, it can't be 100% because nothing's 100%. Nothing makes me more suspicious than a service report that says, oh, we had 98% effectiveness. No, you didn't. Nothing is 98% effective. That's what Housing First was designed to do in the first place. If we're talking about the North American model, the Tisembris model, it was designed for that specific population. If you're talking about homelessness in terms of families, children, poor people with low or no support needs, then Housing First doesn't solve homelessness. Their needs their characteristics are quite different. And of course, Housing First is a reactive service. It's not preventative. And certainly the trend in Europe, particularly in um, Wales in the UK and also now in England in the UK, is to shift towards a really preventative agenda. Again, need to think carefully about the, Amer the evidence. It's North American, a lot of it. The basis for comparison is not the same. Taking my own country as an example, a load of UK services have been harm reduction, user-led, housing-led for 25 years. They're now, by some parties, being criticised as being obsolete and ineffective compared to Housing First. But that claim is based on a comparison made in North America, comparing North American Housing First with North American Alternative Services in another country. And it only uses one indicator, which is ending physical homelessness among people with high and complex needs. So it's a misrepresentation and it's risky to portray everything that isn't Housing First as being inherently ineffective, because we know that's not the, not the case. So how do you use Housing First effectively well, there are long-term and repeatedly homeless people that it can reach. The frequent flyers, the people who avoid all but basic services. But that's not all homelessness. And we need to look beyond individual services or programmes and think about how Housing First is used in a broader sense. Heard about Finland this morning, but Finland's top, so I think we should mention it again. <laughs> Housing First is part of an integrated homelessness strategy. A new hub this morning stressed the importance of prevention, stressed the importance of building making housing units available. I mean, that graph that he showed with homelessness falling and building increasing was very telling, and that's a core part of this strategy. And Housing First is used as part of a mix of lower and higher intensity services, just one of which is Housing First. It's targeted, it does a specific job. Now, the Finnish conception, the Finnish approach, as we heard from Juha this morning, is that Housing First is also a philosophy, an ethos underpinning everything that's done in relation to homelessness in Finland. Everything is about how do we get somebody into a settled home, whether you're talking about Housing First as a congregate service or as a scattered housing service, or in terms of what the Finnish approach to homelessness prevention is. It all starts with the home, it all starts with housing. So you need an adequate, affordable housing supply with reasonable security of tenure. If you don't have that, Housing First will not work. 
Duhar put it in a rather more pithy way this morning, the first thing you need for housing first is housing first. You need a housing supply if you're serious about homelessness prevention and about rapid rehousing responses to homelessness for people with lower needs as well. <coughs> so the best solution is broadly speaking, we're in a context and the thing you should take away from Europe, if indeed you should take anything at all from away from Europe, I don't know, I'm sure you can sort things out for yourselves really. But what Europe says is that what the European evidence tells you is that, broadly speaking, the more extensive the welfare and social policy spending is, the less homelessness there is. Okay, we're not 100% sure on that, but we've got enough data to be pretty confident about it. And that's a key lesson. If society, if a society doesn't do much about affordable housing supply, allows extremes of poverty to occur, and it does not look after its citizens' health and well-being, you get homelessness. It's pretty obvious. There are buttons that you can push that will cause homelessness. You know, and I spent 25 years studying homelessness, actually 27 years studying homelessness. And one of the things I, I do know and feel more confident about perhaps than the solutions to homelessness is I know really clearly what causes it. And if you don't have these things in place, you know, I can, I can put the homelessness up in any society. I could wreck Finland in about 15 minutes <laughs> because I know exactly how to, how to cause it. So Housing First can help when you've got people with complex needs who are falling through existing safety nets. It avoids the frequent flyer risk and all the human and also the financial costs attached to that by people getting stuck in lower intensity services or sometimes getting stuck on the street. And there's a strong case for Housing First, but you need to look to Finland, to other countries. Denmark is another example that has integrated Housing First within a, with a, within a wider, coherent, joined-up homelessness strategy. And you also need prevention, rapid rehousing, lower intensity services, and high intensity, and a high intensity supported housing, and sufficient homes. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Nicholas. That was that was terrific. Um, can I invite to the stage uh, our panel, Paul Flatow and Jane Barnes, to, to take a seat? And while they make themselves comfortable, um, let's do one final audience poll question. So grab your, your phones, grab your tablets, um, and we will go to the conference app for one final audience poll. And the question's coming up on the screen. The biggest factor in ending homelessness in Australia is a massive increase in social housing supply, more political will and more investment, an integrated national strategy, or a focus on prevention. Let's start the countdown. And the winner is... Oh, interesting, a, a good... A split of, of, of votes there, strong support for increased supply, strong support for a strategy, uh, a bit of prevention, political will would be nice, there's a bit of everything there, that's, that's terrific. All right, can I invite uh, Professor Paul Flatow to, to begin the discussion with, with his response to uh, Nicholas's presentation? Um, well, thanks very much, and, and thanks, uh, Nicholas. Um, I wouldn't normally be saying this on the hallowed grounds of the MCG, but that was a magnificent talk from a great Englishman here. Um, <laughs> um, let's, let's start um, at that point about uh, what is housing first and fidelity to the program, because the points that uh, Nicholas was making was not uh, that, um, you know, housing first uh, is a problem, um, quite the contrary. What we need to understand is what housing first is uh, and what the counterfactual to that was uh, in the US context. Um, so housing first, uh, in terms of the original statement of the model, is rapid housing, consumer control, 
uh, scattered site housing and uh, much of it in rental, uh, private rental accommodation for a particular group, namely those uh, with severe mental illness, uh, addiction problems and social isolation. Um, so that was, if you like, the target group and that was the housing first model against the counterfactual of staircase services and getting ho people housing ready. So it's not as though Nicholas is saying uh, that that is a poor model. In fact, he's saying that that's a good model, but let's understand what uh, housing first is. Uh, and we need to, when we're using that phrase, recognize that particular terminology. So we need to use language carefully. Um, and he went on to talk about uh, what is a integrated approach to homelessness. So if, if we use housing first in that particular uh, way, then we're forgetting, if you like, uh, prevention, uh, you know, what causes homelessness in the first place. Uh, we're forgetting about the structural drivers, the economic drivers, housing supply issues. Uh, we're forgetting uh, largely uh, by focusing just on a narrow group of issues, family violence, uh, and so on. Um, and so an integrated strategy um, does require us to look at all of those questions because to end homelessness, uh, we need to go beyond that model of housing first, which is, in my view, a good model, to an integrated strategy and examine all of those factors that are important uh, in terms of homelessness, and we need to be looking at different kinds of groups. Um, so, for example, we know uh, from a lot of research um, that those who are currently homeless as adults, 50% of them started a journey, um, a pathway into homelessness prior to the age of 18. Many of them started a homelessness journey when they're kicked out of home or they run away from home due to fi family violence largely in the house. If we're going to prevent homelessness, uh, it's going to be about communities, schools and families. Um, and that's a fundamental point that we need to recognise, that the strategy to end homelessness is a very broad strategy. Um, if we mean by housing first, rapid housing, um, I think that does apply to virtually every group that we're concerned about who are currently homeless. So if housing first is the, is the narrow model, the original model, um, it is certainly not enough. And so when we use that phrase, let's adopt a housing first approach, let's be careful about the terminology that we're using. Now, one of the big things in the original model, uh, and is there further, uh, and Nicholas did make a point that um, in the European context, it's gone beyond that, but the basic point about choice and control, I think, is very fundamental. Um, and he used the word co-production to extend that concept of choice and control. Uh, we need to listen to people uh, in what they say. Um, one of the great um, experiences that we've had recently in terms of research was to read over 4,000 plus responses uh, to the question, what do you need to be safe and well, which was added in uh, to the um, registry week instrument, apparently um, in Tasmania. So uh, whoever is from Tasmania, great work because you added in a great question. And you need to listen to the responses. So if we're talking about uh, what do we need to do in terms of people's choices, people's choices were very strong. Um, it was about housing first. Um, no one mentioned a plane ticket to Helsinki, but um, there was some very, <laughs> there was some fun responses, no doubt. But it was housing, and I need to get into housing, and many actually provided that kind of if-then uh, answer, which is if I get into housing, I can then uh, look at um, questions around my addiction, mental health issues, and so on. But the answers were also very clear about direct personal social relationships, um, a great loss that uh, had been experienced, uh, and a need to overcome that loss. Um, and employment. Um, there was a, a significant number of people who wanted to get a job. So if we respond to people in terms of choice and co-production, 
we will be taking, uh, walking with them in a path to employment. And that means homelessness services need to take a responsibility uh, to work with people to get people into jobs. Uh, and also legal issues. Um, that comes out very significantly. Now, one of the things that we have seen um, in terms of the Housing First approach, and I would suggest you do read uh, Nicholas's piece on um, Housing First, uh, the evidence base for Europe. Um, it's a really good piece. Um, we have seen some in incredibly strong evaluation take place, um, both in terms of uh, quantitative approaches, um, the use of randomised controlled trials and quasi-experimental evidence at a fairly significant level. Um, but importantly, uh, the emphasis on process evaluation. Um, this is often left to one side and often we don't do it particularly well. But process evaluation will get at the context. Um, and none of you would have ever heard me speak about this because um, I only talk dollars and cents apparently. But um, one of the important um, aspects of a, a critical realist approach is the role of context. And that matters, in my view, almost as much as the program or the structure. And I think that understanding that context uh, to the implementation of the program, who was leading it, what happened, um, is very important, and truth needs to come out on that, so that when we scale up programs, we're not just looking at an impact evaluation set of numbers, but understanding the true context to what went on. Um, I might just go back, if, if I may, uh, to end up on my five minutes, um, to <laughs> two dollars and cents, and um, just talk about that for one moment, because there's no question that if we look at dollars and cents in a narrow way, for example, say in health, we know exactly where we go. Uh, we go to the target group of housing first. Um, if you have a look at our evidence on uh, the use of linked data in, this, in the West Australian context with NPAR and uh, programs that were directed about people getting into housing from homelessness, um, very large savings. Um, but the vast majority of those savings was coming from a very small group. And that's what all our research shows. And that small group was those that had uh, residential psychiatric care. And there's no question that housing provided stability uh, to reduce those particular costs. And that is fundamental. Um, and we need to see a housing first response in that area. But at the same time, we have to ask the question, is that the only basis for an economic response or a human response? Because those with low needs, and every bit of our research says the same things in terms of health and health costs, there's more than 25% that have virtually zero costs in the health area. Does that mean that we don't support them to get into housing? No, it doesn't. Um, does that mean that there won't be any cost savings or cost offsets as a result of supporting people with low costs? Probably not, because the cost savings will be elsewhere. So we have to be very careful in our response around dollars and cents. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And last but by no means least, the final member of the panel is, is Jane Barnes of the Salvation Army. I'm not sure whether I drew the short straw or the long straw to be the, the last speaker at the end of uh, two days of, um, of really terrific uh, presentations. And, and I guess, you know, my, my job today is to think about um, the server provider context and, um, you know, not just in, 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 in uh, terms in relation to what, to what Nicholas has just presented, but I think, you know, it's an opportunity for to reflect on three really um, stimulating international speakers. And, you know, from, from yesterday morning to, you know, cut Mara's into a really small little point there, but, you know, your challenge around the reliable income and, and how important that is. Um, you know, learning this morning about how successful Finland has been. And, and, I, and I guess, you know, Nicholas, to, to finish up with an opportunity for us to look at um, 
the European experience and the learnings and, and for us as providers to um, take this opportunity to actually reflect on some of those things. You know, every day we spend either as, as workers on the front line or, or those of us that, uh, that manage services, you know, managing um, our, our approach to, to working with, with um, people who have been experiencing homelessness, it's, it's an opportunity that I think is um, uh, really welcome and, and, you know, congratulations to, to all of our speakers and to Ahuri and to Homelessness Australia for, you know, really giving us a great, a great couple of days. In Australia, um, Housing First has become very much the dominant practice approach in working with people who have been experiencing chronic homelessness and, uh, and those, of course, who have uh, complex needs. And I think it's fair to say that it's very widely accepted now as the preferred approach in Australia for long-term rough sleepers because it's been demonstrated to be successful. And um, I think that, you know, when we've got demonstrated success, we need to acknowledge that up front. It has, however, been really um, significantly hampered by the scarcity of affordable housing and the appropriateness of that housing when it is available. Um, within Australia, there's um, been variations within the jurisdictions about how Housing First has been implemented. And there's no doubt that where there was guaranteed housing with ha um, the, the, the programs for, for long-term rough sleepers in particular, there's been success. Unfortunately, too few of these programs have had that guaranteed housing. Um, we've also embraced here in Australia, I think, the, con the, the concept of supporting housing. And, and generally here, we tend to think about it in terms of congregate and cluster uh, model rather than the dispersed model. And we've found that this type of housing response is really effective for a very, very small um, a group of people who've not only got complex needs and who have experienced chronic homelessness, but who've also faced extreme isolation and, and complete disengagement from community and, and have had a significant trauma within their, within their lives. And I um, chuckled a little bit, you know, because supporting housing can be dismissed as expensive and Americans aren't the only ones that don't like things that are expensive. We find that here, here in Australia too. But I think also we're building the case of the evidence that say for this very small group of people, it's a really effective um, and strong support, uh, response. And when you look at the outcomes and you look at it, and hopefully as we do build that evidence over the longer term, we'll see that it's not actually an expensive option. Unfortunately, there are some similarities here um, with the situations that you've outlined in, in, in the UK and in Italy where our um, funding's precarious. Uh, many programs that do kind of work in this housing first space are doing so with no forward commitment beyond the, the current financial year, which creates an environment of uncertainty, not only for staff, um, but particularly for, for the clients. And I guess even beyond that though is um, the commissioning framework that services, um, homelessness services are purchased here in Australia, it's, it's just not helpful. It's built on, on targets of throughput and length of stay. And it doesn't allow for a flexible, um, and the, or the sort of flexibility, sorry, that is required in terms of the support and the longer term support that is required to sustain the housing once it's gained. Majority of um, homelessness services in Australia focus primarily on crisis and transitional. I'm telling people who know all of this, but six and 12 week periods of support, um, which are the most common funded option, uh, are not adequate. And whilst there's been some extension of these, particularly um, I think we've seen in the, the National Street to Home approach, um, it's been you know extended out to two years. But there's still an expectation that after two years, homelessness service providers will be able to withdraw. It's a good theory. If there were other long-term support options available. But in most cases, they're not. Programs that might have been able to provide this sort of long-term support, like the, the Commonwealth Government's Personal Helpers and Mentors Program, it's being rolled into the NDIS. And early evidence is saying that the client group that needs that longer term support is not going to be eligible and they're not going to get access to the services under the NDIS. 
the money's going to go to others. It's not going to go to this client group. And I think that we really need to give a lot of thought to how do we um, create the longer term support options, which will be um, and are necessary if we're going to retain housing. Can I just say I was really, really encouraged by your statement that not all pre-housing first models are ineffective because there is, you know, there's a bit of a tendency to say if it's not housing first, we don't want it, we don't want to, um, to fund it. It does need to be considered within the context of a broad strategy. And that strategy, you know, as, as Paul sort of also indicated, needs to include prevention. It does need to include rapid rehousing. It does need that lower flexibility. It does need, um, or the lower intensity, sorry. It needs flexibility, but it also needs that higher intensity. Um, in Victoria, our, our peak body, the Council of Homeless Persons, produced a paper a couple of years ago around creating a framework for ending homelessness, and they highlighted all of these service system elements. And, uh, and I think that we would all agree that we do need that broad approach. Um, and I think we all just answered that in the question. And I'm assuming that within that, those that tick the strategy box that housing was a part of that strategy, yeah? Um, couple of final things. Work does need to be done in, in our um, prevention and early intervention space. And I think a key challenge here though is the lack of integration that whilst we have a strong welfare system, we do have a lack of integration and despite a lot of work that's been done to try to get over um, some of those problems, we are not well integrated with um, uh, primary and secondary health services. And in some ways we're actually going backwards and, and I, those Victorians that are here might probably uh, endorse the, 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 the experiences that we've had with the recommissioning of our alcohol and drug system and our mental health system, which has made it extremely difficult for us to, to develop integrated services unless they're specifically funded as such. Um, but, you know, there's no doubt that if we do get um, our prevention end of the work done better, that we will, uh, we will reduce the number of people that, are, that enter into homelessness. And, uh, you know, and I think that if we also work across some of those really high risk areas, out of home care, um, youth justice, prisons, hospitals, mental health, inpatient, you know, you know the list. We need to do better. Just finally, that if we think about um, investments in, in that prevention space and we think about shifting our focus away from time limit, limited services and more toward what are the outcomes that we're looking for, you know, that outcomes based framework. Um, you know, I think that that would significantly improve our system. But just before I finish, I just want to say that, because you know, I can't resist, people working across the specialist homelessness service system have become really creative. That you know, we do well with really scarce resources and we do well to connect people to those resources. But the bottom line, without appropriate, affordable, safe, long-term, secure tenure, accommodation options, housing options, we're never going to be able to provide lasting solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Clearly we have a, a genuinely expert panel. We have some time now for questions and answers um, from, from the audience. You can put questions in through the app, as you know, um, and we have some mic runners available, so please raise your hand and, and uh, ask a question or make a comment. Do we have questions from the floor? Everyone's pretty tired. There's one over here, over, over to, my, <coughs> to my right. Um, so Nicholas, in regards to some of the commitments we got over here in Australia several years ago about the spikes that went up around London to stop the rough sleepers going through, is that still occurring or has the actual government looked at the idea of uh, turning a blind eye to it? Um, well, it's not a housing first question, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean and th there was stuff happening around um, putting spikes on the pavement doing things like putting um, extra armrests, armrests in inverted commas, on benches to stop people sleeping on them. And the, the worst thing was the kind of hot washing. They use direct um, street cleaning machines at areas where homeless people are, are, are sleeping. Um, 
there is there, there has been a quite a lot of opposition towards that. I mean, the the, the reasons why rough sleeping are happening in London are complex. Um, part of the issue is around the quality of services, the availability of housing. London, like a lot of major European cities, there is actually quite a lot of economic um, migration from people from the south and east of Europe who come to the UK seeking work, can't access a lot of services because they, they, they can't um, get access to them can't find work and end up on the, on the street. That's a very specific problem though. I mean, almost no UK homelessness is, a, is migrant homelessness, but that particular population, there is a migrant population within it, but almost everybody else in the UK who's homeless is a UK citizen. So there's, there's particular things happening in London around what the, what's causing the increases. We've had a question come through on the app asking, um, is there a place for funds to go to programs such as the Dignity First approach in Queensland, almost the opposite of Housing First, uh, which do not link to housing outcomes? Would anyone would like to respond to that? I can't because I don't know what Dignity First Dign is. So Dign <laughs> it's essentially um, resolving the, the wraparound services before the housing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends what exactly what it means. I mean, if, if it means um, you put people into supported housing and you try and make them housing ready so that housing comes last rather than housing coming first, um, for people with high and complex needs, the evidence base is that it just doesn't work. And that's, that's American, Northern European, I mean, it, it, those... Yeah, whether or not you're looking at what happened in the States, what happened in Sweden, which had a similar model, um, it, it doesn't work for that particular group. Now, that's not the same thing as saying those services are necessarily ineffective for, any, for everybody. Because, so take the North American example, those, thing, those kinds of services had a 40 to 60% success rate quite often compared to a 70 to 90 percent success rate for Housing First. And Housing First was more effective with people with really high and complex needs who got stuck in those services and couldn't complete all the steps to come out of, of homelessness. But you need to be careful, like I said, about saying a particular thing never works or over-claiming for any particular intervention like Housing First. One of the things that Housing First can do, for example, if it's working properly, is it is a harm reduction model, but if you're serious about co-production around taking a consumer-led approach to homelessness, if somebody says, I want to go into detox, or I want to do a 12-step or an abstinence program, you facilitate that, you don't stop it. <coughs> so it's about that kind of flexibility. It's all, all really about recognising individual needs listening to people and being prepared to respond flexibly to those needs. We have a couple of questions down the front here. One in the third row, then one in the front row. resistance to helping people who are in poverty. Do you think that those attitudes that do prevail in the, in the public psyche do impede things like Housing First getting up here um, when it could be seen that we're rewarding people for doing nothing by giving them homes? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I'll jump in on that. Um, and it may relate a little bit to the dignity side. I was going to say on the dignity side, uh, there's no question that all the responses that we've seen um, in that registry week data was around the, the desire for housing. Uh, but it, you could put all of the other things, in a sense, under a term such as dignity. I mean, there's no question that people have suffered uh, grief and loss and need to go through a personal journey. Um, and want to, to, uh, to get through that journey to a point of dignity. Um, 
in, the, in, in terms of the public perception, I, I personally see this uh, time as a time where um, there is a gr probably a greater um, uh, desire to do something about homelessness in, if you like, the general population. So we're not talking about a, a specific group of politicians, but if I'm talking about people I talk to, uh, or even students, um, say, in my environment, uh, who, who now talk about homelessness as a major social issue that they wish to address, in the same way that they talk about extreme uh, poverty, if you like, uh, global poverty. And that is something that uh, has occurred recently and has increased. So whatever is happening in the, the national dialogue um, and whatever happens in culture wards and all the rest of it, I think um, if I was to take a, my own straw poll about this, I actually think that there's more uh, interest and empathy now uh, than ever before. I think it's an uphill battle. Um, I, and I think that the, the, the survey results this morning that, um, that the minister presented kind of showed us how far we've got to go where the majority of Victorians think that, you know, a meal and a blanket is what's needed to help people who are experiencing homelessness. So, yeah. There was another question down the front here. Just, just a quick query. The, um, the, the finished guy this morning was sort of implying that um, the day he got the problem solved, we're living in a haunted era of two years. Yes. The uh, Salvation Army was a bit of a strange view of this. We would never have solved the problem. We're talking about a perfect solution to sort of thing. Is that, is that because Australia is more America, Europe, when Finland's Europe, Europe, do you think? <laughs> 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 because we are, you know, we're a different ethos to, to them, in effect. Or is, do you think it's because of politics? Uh, good question. Um, I think, I think that it's a really complex situation and I guess my final point there was, was really around the fact that there's a whole lot of things that we need to bring together. Um, you know, we, we, we um, uh, are finding increasing housing costs, scarcity of housing, so we, ne we obviously need to be dealing with that, the housing issue. Um, we are uh, in an environment now where more people are being breached and, and losing income support than they ever have before. So whilst we have that safety net, um, it is, you know, it's falling apart. So, uh, so I guess maybe it was a little bit negative, but I, I, I think we're a long way from, from, from Finland, but, um, but you know, I do think that it's, um, it's a fair and reasonable thing for us to think that we can end homelessness. If we're not thinking, if we don't <coughs> think that we can end it, then, then I'm not sure why, what we're doing in the business. But, but I do think that it's a very complex um, uh, and, and, and long situation and, and primarily um, you know I think that there's uh, a whole lot of reasons a whole lot of reasons for that and I think that because of that Salvation Army is certainly not going to say we're never going to solve the problem <coughs> um, and certainly Jane Barnes from the Salvation Army is not going to say that um, but I but I do believe that that you know there's so many different elements that have to come together in order for us to get that lasting solution and I, I'd, I'd add to, to that as well. I mean, um, I've been really struck the last couple of days with how much <coughs> good practice and the innovative ideas, how much stuff is happening here. Yeah. It's a very different context from North America. I mean, obviously, you're more civilised if you play cricket. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, I'm, I'm seeing stuff here that, I mean, y you know, I, I've spent some time in, the, <coughs> in, in North America, and yeah, there's housing first, but uh, honestly, there is stuff happening, even in quite, even in contexts like Canada, which to UK, European eyes, it's like down and out in Paris and London. I mean, it's pretty primitive stuff, massive, mm. very basic shelters and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm not getting that sense in terms of the kinds of things that have been talked about here the kind of practice that you've got here. To be honest, it's, it's, it's very similar to being a, a homeless link, which is the Federation of um, Homeless Organisations in the UK. You know, I'm seeing a lot of, I'm, I'm 
I've seen a lot of practice that reflects what's happening in the UK, Northwestern Europe, but I'm also seeing, seeing things that we're not thinking about. I mean, like the project to extend, make sure that homeless people have got the franchise. I mean, I've, I've looked at that and thought, God, we should be doing that. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we making sure that people are in a position to vote? And other really interesting stuff as well. So um, while you've got um, issues and problems and all kinds of challenges which reflect those in Europe, um, I think you, you know, should also kind of pat yourselves on the back a bit because there is positive stuff happening here. And there's, I mean, the energy from so many of you coming together for this is a really positive sign as well. Mm. Nicholas, a couple of more, more or less technical questions just to follow up on your presentation. Um, one around what the success rate was in the housing, in, in the UK housing first um, experience of retaining clients over, say, a two-year period. You know. So our, our, our housing first is, is, the minute is held together with, with bits of string. It's very basic. We're in the same kind of contracting environment that was being talked about that, that quite often People are running on a year's money, um, and sometimes less, which makes planning very difficult. And, and there's issues around housing supply and, and, and funding things. That's probably going to change to some extent because central government has taken an interest and has committed 28 million to a new pilot <coughs> city. Um, so our services are quite basic, quite often, quite thinly resourced and, and quite small, so you don't want to generalise too much, but seven to eight out of every ten, it's pretty similar to what's being achieved elsewhere. But it's, just to emphasise really quickly again, it's very different from, say, the French programme, which is a you know, tens of millions in expenditure, and a British Housing First service might literally be three people with 15, 10, 15 service users hacking together whatever housing solutions they can find in the social and private rented sector. I think when you uh, look at those kind of rates, um, and certainly that, um, what I would see as a housing first uh, uh, <coughs> model, it wasn't actually referred to as such really. Uh, the Nisha case in Sydney uh, was rapid housing with support uh, for, for those who are chronically homeless, and, and our data showed that. Um, the 89% tenancy um, rate that was achieved there uh, was achieved, um, you know, after two years, was achieved with a huge amount of uh, engagement um, in terms of, of uh, tenancies at risk. So at least a third of those tenancies that uh, we're, we're looking at were at high risk. Um, and another third were at low risk and only one third were, if you like, no risk. And um, the basic point is that uh, the tenancies were saved because support workers jumped in and kept going and, and, and really worked very hard at, at, at significant points where the tenancy was at risk. So, um, and that's what we, we need to look at when we're doing these evaluations. We have to understand how this was achieved, what was happening on the ground. Uh, who was doing what? It was actually people who were doing, who were doing things. And uh, when we scale up, we have to understand those kinds of things. And that's why qualitative evidence and, and uh, that process evaluation stuff is so critical to an understanding of the actual quantitative uh, outcomes. Yeah, and that's the, that's the different thing in the European context, is the intensity of the support that Housing First offers. So you've got the kind of client ratios that you know, I was talking about this morning, you know, sort of five, six, maybe no more than eight or nine people being <coughs> worked with by any one worker at any point, compared to what we were doing before Housing First, which is one worker who might have a client load of 25 or 30, just couldn't engage at the same level. So it's the intensity that seems to make a difference. Mm. We'll take just one final question we have uh, towards the back there. whether the models that we've undertaken around the cost effectiveness of programs like Housing First but other programs um, have included in supply as part of that 
Um, well, with the exception of, of Finland and to some extent Denmark, um, other countries haven't built, they've used existing stock. Um, so there hasn't been an additional cost attached to that. And the original North American model didn't either, it used the private rented sector. So, um, I mean, you've got, you've got kind of different things happening. I mean, the, if you um, take a, a kind of congregate communal approach, you have to physically build something, and that has a lot of cost attached to it. Um, and that kind of housing can be more expensive to run than, than ordinary housing. Um, I mean, if you're gonna tackle homelessness as a, as a whole, um, you really need to be looking at your supply of adequate affordable housing more generally, and then just allocating a bit of that towards housing first. There's always a, an alternative to whatever housing you have. There's always an opportunity cost, um, and it really depends on how far you wanna take the economic modeling. Um, uh, we've often incorporated the opportunity cost of capital in, in calculations, but, um, and, and the numbers look, still look reasonably good, I must say. But at the same time, if you look at uh, the cost effectiveness of this kind of studies, they're very, very narrow. Um, they, they, they hardly have uh, the, the full lifetime modeling, and they take into account a relatively small range of costs because that's where the data is. And, um, you know, over time, uh, we'll get uh, a better understanding of, of more lifetime costs. Uh, but yeah, they, those capital costs um, have been taken out into account, generally speaking. Not always, but. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for this session. Can I, can I ask you to please join me in thanking our speaker, Nicholas Police, and our panelists, Joan Barnes and Paul Flatter. Thank you.